so I've been looking for a laptop within my budget. One that has an Intel 12th gen processor, a sizable screen, and a GPU with respectable graphics power. The machine I found is the Predator Helios 300. <laughs> Yo, it's codename Catfish, and as you can see, I am neither cat nor fish. I'm a robot, and today, I'll be talking about this laptop I just bought from Amazon at a discount. It's the 2022 version of Acer's Predator Helios 300, with a 17-inch panel. Now before I go through with this video, I should mention that this is not a sponsored video, nor am I a professional. But I'll make this overview of the laptop to the best of my ability and resources. Here we go! So let's first look at its input and output. On its left side, it has a lock slot, a 2.5 gigabit ethernet port, a USB-A 3.2 port, and a good old headphone jack. On the right, it's got two more USB-A 3.2 ports. Adorable! On the back, it's got a mini display port 1.4, a 2.1 HDMI port, a USB-C Thunderbolt 4 port, and of course, a power charging barrel port. So yeah, it has a fair number of ports, but if you need more, you could always use these. Next, we'll be looking at its build quality. To help me do this, I have built these hands. Say hi to the camera. So the laptop is supposed to weigh about 6.6 .6 pounds. That's what it says on their site. I don't have a scale to verify. The lid and the keyboard base feels like aluminium. The front bezel and the bottom seem to be made of plastic. The hinges feel like plastic on the lid side and the screen side. They seem to hold up quite well considering the screen is a bit heavy. The top of the lid flexes when you push down on it. It kind of feels like a spring, but... Even just brushing your hand on it makes it flex, though. I would avoid putting stuff on top of it. In other words, must protect. The rubber stopper around the bezel is one piece and it's really thin. It feels a little cheap, though, but it should get the job done as long as you don't slam the lid down, which you shouldn't be doing anyway. Also, I wouldn't open the lid with your fingernail, because it feels like you can damage the rubber stopper this way. Typing on the keyboard feels pretty decent. The keyboard feels tactile enough. It's not the best laptop keyboard I typed on though. That would be this MSI. It kinda feels like that, but just barely mushier. Hey, this turbo button feels nice. The trackpad is a nice good size, and the left and right click is underneath. I really like it a lot. I think it feels really nice to use. Overall, I think the laptop might have an above average build quality. The aluminium really helps make it feel premium. But as I said though, be careful with the lid and the rubber stopper. Basically, you should treat this like an expensive laptop and do your best to be careful and take care of it. We'll go over a few features in Predator Sense. Not all of them though, just the ones relevant to performance. This is the home screen. You can see your temps, and you have quick access to your lighting profiles, modes, and fan controls. In the monitor tab, you have a few more stats to look at, like your specs clocks and frequencies, and internet speeds too. You have a few options for fan controls in this app. Auto uses its default fan curve to know if it's good or not. You can also max out your fan speeds. And with custom, you can set the speeds of both your fans, but you can't make your own fan curve here. That's pretty lame. The laptop has a few modes to work with. Default mode has its frequencies and clock speeds limited, and it's the only mode available when the laptop is not plugged in. Quiet mode turns on in video whisper mode, which I assume optimizes the machine for lower temperatures over performance. Extreme mode will overclock the frequencies and core clock speeds, and turbo mode is extreme mode with the fans running at max speeds. In this gear tab, it has two notable settings. LCD overdrive is supposed to help mitigate ghosting on its LCD screen, but the color accuracy may go down. It'll be up to you if you want to turn it on or not. 
and discrete GPU mode will increase the performance of the GPU when turned on. It's basically a muck switch. You could also change this in the BIOS if you want. So that's the laptop and its main features. Wish there were more options in the fan controls. Time to get to my favorite part, the specs. Let's start with the screen. The laptop's panel is a 17.3 inch 1080p 144Hz IPS panel that supports G-Sync of course. I'm not really good at measuring nits, but yeah, the screen looks pretty good. Now let's look underneath. Check it out, it uses liquid metal. So the processor is the i7-12700H. It's a 14 core 20 thread processor. Well, technically, it has 6 performance cores and 8 efficiency cores. The machine comes with 16 gigabytes of DDR5 RAM that clocks up to 4800 MHz. You can upgrade the RAM, of course. The GPU is the RTX 3060, 6 gigabytes. It has half the VRAM of its desktop counterpart, but it does have a 140 watt TGP. It only comes with half a terabyte of storage, but it does come with another M.2 slot. So I put in another M.2 to help fit some more games. The machine is equipped with some battery that could last up to 6 hours depending on what you're doing. Or rather what you're not doing. Otherwise when plugged in, it's all powered by a 280 watt charging brick. The OS it comes with is Windows 11 Home Edition, but Home Edition sucks, so I upgraded it to Pro. So those are the laptop specs. Can't wait to try them out. So before we start benchmarking some games, I'll go over how I'll set this up. The laptop will be plugged in, the MUX switch will be on, and we'll set it to extreme mode. We'll keep the fans on auto, but if it gets too hot, no problem. We'll flip on turbo mode. We'll play games at 1080p, and I'll cap the frame rate to 144 FPS. With all of that out of the way, it's playtime! Let's start with Monster Hunter Rise. So DLSS was added into the game with the Sunbreak update. We gotta try it. We'll be playing on high settings. We'll do this quest, and we'll start with DLSS off and hunt Toby Kadachi. So we are in area 7 of the map, and the frame rate jumps between the 120s and the FPS cap, though we did go under 120 momentarily. Now we're in area 2. Excuse my playstyle. I was half asleep while recording this, so I was kinda just jumping around. After about 8 minutes, we slay Toby Kadachi, and we average that 137 FPS. Well, that's not bad. Next, we'll hunt Daimeo Hermitor, but this time we'll set DLSS to quality. We find it in area 11, and it looks like we're getting somewhat higher frame rate numbers. I did notice it's higher looking at the beach side. So now we're in area 5 on the map, and we can actually stay at 144 FPS quite a bit. Not all the time though. So we slay the monster, and we average that 141 FPS. Very nice. Lastly, we hunt the Rathian, and we'll set DLSS to ultra performance. So we're in area 10 on the map, and so far, it looks like the frame rate isn't doing that much better than DLSS quality. Strange. We're back in area 7 and the frame rate average went up a bit. I'm trying to get the tail. There we go. We pursue it to area 5, and after a few more hits, we slay the Rathian, and the quest is completed. Our frame rate averaged at 140 FPS. So the game already performs well without DLSS, and it did help boost our performance a bit. But the performance between quality and performance settings did not seem to be different. To know what the deal here is, well, whatever. Gameplay's pretty good in the arena though, and this is with no DLSS. We haven't gotten any lower than 140, and we averaged at 144 FPS, so that's cool. Next, we'll play Genshin Impact. We'll play at high settings, and the game's max frame rate cap is 60, because apparently, PC doesn't have the privileges that Apple devices have. That would make too much sense. So to put it simply, the game will play at 60 FPS sharp, but it does stutter sometimes, which I assume comes from background loading and stuff. If you're wondering why I'm terrible at this game, it's because I'm uninspired to play. After playing Breath of the Wild, I kinda don't want to play a gacha version of it. Also, I can't still pull my ice waifu, so that's lame. 
off topic, but I finally pulled this Celian Honkai, and I got her weapon too, so that's cool. Well, there really isn't much else to say. You know they really should increase the frame rate cap, and the game may be worth benchmarking. That might inspire me to play more, besides pulling my Ice Waifu, of course. In Elden Ring, I tried playing a hero class this time, and we're gonna play at max settings. The game caps at 60, by the way. So far, the game's actually running at 60 FPS, but sometimes it may stutter into the 50s here. Now we're in this forest area, and we're in the low 50s. Well, that's a bummer. I guess we're gonna have to play at high settings. So now we're playing at high settings. We're running at 60 in this same forest area. Good, because it would be really lame if we had to tone down any more settings. So I had a recording where I was playing at max settings, but I forgot to turn it on to extreme mode, and I also forgot to max out the fans, so the temperatures are horrible. Regardless, we're fighting this dragon, and it's not just any dragon, it's a flying dragon. We're gonna beat him up. Despite the issues I just mentioned, the frame rate's actually doing just fine for the most part, but I don't recommend letting your specs reach this high, as they can throttle the performance. But the temps aren't the only thing that's hot. So you know how I said I suck at this game? Well, watch this. Oh yeah, who sucks now? Now I just gotta figure out how I'm gonna beat up that bear. We'll try something different this time. We'll play Sid Meier Civilization 6. Except, I'm not gonna play the game. Finishing a session could take who knows how long. Instead, we have these four in-game benchmarks to play with. First, here are the graphics settings we'll be using. I guess we'll be playing with dual ultra settings, so I'll go over what each benchmark does, and show you my results. This is our basic graphic benchmark. While waiting for results, I noticed our frame rate is different for each turn, so I guess we aren't playing the game at 144 frames, huh? After about a minute, it'll tell us our average frame time, which is 7.8 milliseconds, and our 99th percentile too. It'll also give us a log of our frame time stats to look at, so that's cool. Next, we have an AI benchmark. This'll test our CPU performance by seeing how long the CPU takes between the AI's turns, so this should be quite interesting. After 5 turns, we get our results. Our average turn time is about 7.5 seconds. It logs a table for how long each turn was. Neat. Now we're doing Gathering Storm's update graphic benchmark. Like the last graphic benchmark, our frame rate is indeed different for each turn. In some turns, it even went under 100 FPS. Our results come in, and our average frame time is 9.8 milliseconds. Like before, it logs our frame time stats to look at. Finally, we'll do Gathering Storm's AI benchmark. While waiting for our results, I noticed some instances of stuttering this time. Gee, this turn sure is taking much longer than the turns in the last AI benchmark. I'm waiting. So after about two and a half minutes, we finally get our results. Our turn time average is about 33 seconds. In the log, we can see that the first turn took the longest to finish, and all other turns took about 30 seconds. Hmm. These numbers are cool and all, but they aren't going to look impressive unless we compare them to other computers' results. So I decided to do these benchmarks with my main computer and my Alienware X51R2. Same settings, of course. As you can see, the Alienware gets outgenned by the newer computers, especially in graphics, but it wasn't far behind in a normal AI benchmark. In the Gathering Storm AI benchmark, my desktop and my laptop averages are very similar. In turn 1, my desktop actually took 2 seconds longer than the Helios, and in turn 5, my desktop beats the Helios by about 3 seconds. Wow, maybe I should consider upgrading my CPU and my desktop to Raptor Lake when it comes out. We're playing Cyberpunk. And it actually has a benchmark tool in it, which I didn't notice before because I'm a dumb dumb. 
So what I'm going to do is run the benchmark with the view preset settings and show you my results. Here are the FPS averages I did with a few graphic settings I used. Ray tracing ultra presets with DLSS off is just... No. Yeah, I don't think you're going to get away with ray tracing here. Not without the help of DLSS at least. But for real though, who needs ray tracing anyway? The ultra preset looks much more promising, but it can go below 60 for some time, and our frame time doesn't seem ideal either. But if you flip on DLSS quality, all of our frame stats look much better. We are well above 60 FPS. High settings without DLSS seems closest to ideal, but there's no shame in flipping it on if you want to, and it obviously helps performance. I went and played with high settings with DLSS quality, so we're driving around in this area at night, and the performance is doing pretty good. We did hit 59 FPS, but it's whatever. Personally, these are the settings I would play the game if I actually wanted to play the game, which I don't. I don't want to play the game. The last game we'll do is Multiverses. I haven't tried this game before, so this should be fun. We are playing at high settings. And yeah, the game caps at 60. We'll play with bots in 2v2. I'ma try playing Finn. So I'm playing horribly because I'm still new to this game. But at least we're running at 60. The rest of the frame stats are a little bouncy though. The game feels a little floaty compared to Smash Brothers. But maybe I can get used to this once I stop playing like an idiot. Let's try 1v1 against a bot. So I'll play Wonder Woman this time, and we're fighting Harley Kim. We're gonna beat her up. So we're running at 60 of course, and it looks like the other frame stats are doing a little better this time. That's cool. Look at all this beating up I'm doing. So what do I think about this laptop? Well, as I mentioned, the build quality seems exceptional for the most part, but you shouldn't get careless with it, or any expensive laptop for that matter. The keyboard is decent, and the trackpad is pretty good. I think the cooling on this laptop is just fine, but I don't think the fan curve on the auto fan setting is very good, so you'll have to use other fan settings. I love the performance on this machine. The 12700H seems like a very capable mobile CPU, and this mobile 3060 is very powerful too. One problem I can see is, the performance is not very future resistant for gaming. Why? Because it only has 6GB of VRAM. Since we are in a new generation of gaming, at least we're supposed to be, some newer games could need more and bigger resources to load such as textures. When we were benching Cyberpunk, it was very close to the VRAM limit. If it did hit the limit, it could cause the game to stutter, which would be very lame. So what do you think about this laptop? Do you think it's a good laptop? Would you prefer to buy other laptops within its price range? Or perhaps you would prefer to save up for a better laptop? Or just build a desktop? Let me know in the comments! So thanks for watching this video. I never done a laptop video before, so I hope it came out okay. But I do like this laptop so far. Hopefully it doesn't break. If you happen to like this video, or perhaps you found it helpful in some way, consider hitting the like button and subscribing. Or you can dislike it if you don't like it. And don't forget to share the video. With your help, I can become best girl. Alright, that should be everything. Bye!